for Sephardic Jews, um, their home was the Torah, and they would use the uh, other books, especially the Talmud, as commentary. What happened with the Ashkenazi is that they found themselves becoming um, experts in the Talmud and asking Talmudic experts to come to them and, and pushing the Torah to one side till eventually some among the Ashkenazi even began to deny the Torah. They refused to accept it and said, our two books are the Talmud and the Zohar, the commentary on the Talmud. It, it, it reached such a stage that... that well, because, because, the, because they, were being, they were being excluded from m much of the... Pro of the of the prophecy that was guaranteed them in the Torah, so they, they felt maybe that they were not being uh, fairly um, uh, graced by God in those particular books. So they chose, the, they chose to go to the place that was going to give them the best deal. Exactly. Mm. And, and also, what was important from the perspective of the monarchy of the Khazars was that... Um, they had a vested interest in making sure that happened because when they brought all of these um, uh, uh, Jewish scholars in and the people became uh, Jews and studied their Judaism under them, he wanted to make sure that he had um, a, um, a spin on the Judaism which left him as king and left them as loyal subjects to him and not subjects to, um, you know, some rabbi in some far distant land. So he had to, it was also, a he had a political reason for making sure that they saw him in a light which was above that, that their own um, position, that, that is to say the rabbis. Now I want to talk about two groups that came out of, out of both Sephardism and, and Ashkenaziism. What, what we've got up in the north is, uh, is a migration into the ghettos, and they, the reason they ghettoized their society uh, was to keep their group uh, cohesive, because they felt that as soon as they began to move into the general population, they was, there was a, a watering down of their, of their faithful, and as a result of that, they, were, they would have uh, a loss of their community power and the, and, uh, and the, the strength of their maybe their future strength within the community. So what we've got growing out of that region is uh, certain movements. One of them was a Frankist movement, and, and another one was, uh, well, it was being run by groups of, of um, Kabbalistic uh, practicing, um, tal uh, well, I, I don't know, Kabbalists for the, for the most part, who, who also wanted the, 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 the community to stay closely together and they demanded tithes from these people in order to keep a power base that was structured at the top. The reason I'm getting to that is because there was great fortunes that were handed over to certain groups within this um, dynasty that gave birth to the things such as the Rothschild fortunes and so forth. So I want to I talk about the, the movement in the northern European areas of Lithuania and Latvia and, and uh, even... Um, the, the area of Lubavitch, in fact, because that's one city that was a very large uh, co concentration of, uh, of Jewish rabbinical scholars. Uh, do you have information on those things? Well, that's kind of um, fast-forwarding a little bit down the centuries. Mm -hmm. um, ju just looking at, um, um, I, and I want to finish with this because this, this statement here is very important in terms of um, um, why the Khazars also maintain their own identity. I'm going to quote now from Heiko Hauman, a history of East European Jews. He says, Apparently, part of the Khazar Jews remained in their areas of settlement, like you were saying, in Hungary, Latvia, Slovenia, um, Croatia, Morav uh, Mor uh, you know, all of the, these parts of Russia and Kiev. Uh, they remained in their areas of settlement because... There is evidence of a messianic movement among the Jewish Khazars of the Crimea. Yeah. So what had basically happened was that um, a lot of the Ashkenazi Jews at this stage, um, practices of Judaism, um, had a messianic movement forming in the Crimea. Now, for, to understand how important the Messiah is, uh, you've got to remember that um, all Jews and practices of Judaism and the tribes of Israel are all messianic in that they are awaiting 
um, the end of this diaspora. They're waiting for salvation. They believe that the Messiah will come, and when he does, um, he will lead them in a new kingdom, starting from, uh, which will be uh, in Jerusalem, and his throne will be in Jerusalem, and he will rule the world from there. And this is uh, prophecy which all Jews uh, believe in, no matter what their uh, sect of Judaism. And of course, what we've, what we've got here is that in the 11th and 12th centuries, in the, in the area of the Crimea, we have a, a messianic movement. And the reason there's a messianic movement is that the, the king of the Khazars himself had a semi-messianic position. Because he was, you know, a king, he commanded mighty armies, he was in charge of huge parts of the world, and he was a Jew. So right. their, their view was, hey, th this guy's, you know, the, the progenitor of the man who's going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem. And, and so one of the things that the Ashkenazi became very um, noticeable for was their tendency, not only for practicing Talmud and getting deeply into Kabbalah, but also this messianism. Whereas when we look at the Sephardi, the Sephardi view is God has thrown us out of uh, Jerusalem and the land of uh, Israel. We've been thrown out of there and we have to wait for him to ask us to come back. Because God has said we're not allowed to return until he says so. Now, this is where uh, we see uh, political Zionism, if you like, starting uh, yeah. to manifest. And, and well, because, because in just by virtue of this particular king professing a religion, uh, he, is, he, is all, he is already proclaiming himself to have certain rights within the, the hierarchy of, uh, of, of return to Jerusalem and everything else, because most kings of that era um, were kings by divine providence. And if you, you look through the Christian world, um, you know, the king of, the, the sun king, Louis, was, was there by God's, uh, God's own graces. And, uh, and they were sanctioned by the, uh, by the Vatican and given, given uh, validity through their religious affiliation. And so I don't think that period in the Khazaria region was any different. Indeed. In fact, even more so, because the, the kings, obviously, of Khazaria started to look like King David and King Solomon, especially having these big armies and something all over the people, uh, all over the place, and taxing the Vikings and taxing everybody who tried to do business to them. Um, it, it, they had this um, uh, aura he, he, they managed to pull this aura, and they kept that going, and that became part of their understanding of Judaism. And what then happened was that, sort of, like you're saying, push, push the clock on a bit, and we find ourselves in the 17th century under a man um, called Shabbatai Zevi, who um, spawned what was the largest messianic movement in the last 2,000 years among the Jews. I mean, he was massive. Um, it was a very messianic century. The Christian, because the year 1666 was on its way, the Christians thought Jesus was coming back, and there was a particular date which was auspicious in the Jewish calendar, where a lot of people thought it may be the date of the return of the Messiah. And this guy, uh, Zabotai, uh, Shabbatai Zevi, he was alive at that time. He was a renowned Kabbalist. Uh, one of, one of the interesting facts that I want to I start finishing up with, because what we've decided to do because of the enormity of this subject is to take this particular subject into a couple of uh, segments, because it, it is a great deal of information, and we do want people to be able to uh, um, you know, make, make their own inquiries if, if they're interested or look into the, the, the things that we're claiming uh, to be um, and, and, of course, the book that much of our information comes from is on my website at IamTheWitness.com. So, Mohammed, what could you, could you say the next phase of our discussions, uh, possibly tomorrow, uh, would be about in, in regards to this? Yes, well, um, um, I, I, I agree with you, Darryl. The, the thing that we're trying to cover here for, for the listeners out there is obviously um, 
3,000 years of history almost, and we're trying to encapsulate it um, as best we can. Um, what we need to look into, Daryl, um, from, from this are what are the implications of this history today? Right. And, and also, how did it develop, uh, and what are the implications of those developments? Because well, because this, this religious stuff has turned into a geopolitical, um, a modern-day geopolitical question, hasn't it? Indeed. The, we went from Eretz Israel, the expression, um, the love of Israel, how we would expect religious Jews to, to want to go back into God's favor. They want to, the, the diaspora to end, but now we've got a group of guys who are saying, hey, I'm not waiting for God, let's not wait for God, we're going to make this happen ourselves. And it's about how that came about, and whether there is, because we know the Christians give a lot of support to this, whether there is evidence for support for this in the Bible, or whether as Christians they should actually be opposing it. Well, I, I, I agree with you, and I, I know the second half of the story. That's why I, I can tell you now that I'm, I already agree with that statement. Somebody who, who looks at the world from the perspective of Scripture, especially the, the Old Testament, and uh, Christians who, who accept these prophecies, I, I'm not saying to them, don't believe your prophecy, don't believe that they're not going to come true, but we have to, you know, look at what the Netere Carter teach here, because... You know what they say, Daryl, is they say these prophecies here will be fulfilled after the Messiah comes. Mm -hmm. So they say when the Messiah comes, he will bring them in and he will put the, the life on the dry bones. But and not a Messiah the... designed by the very group who already launched the control over the region. In other words... The descendants of this guy you talked about yesterday, which we're going to get to in a minute, Sabbatai Zevi, mm -hmm. you said that he launched a program of um, this group, of this, this Khazarian group, to start waiting for a messiah or actually create one. Well, th this, this is the thing. The, the, um, the Torah observant Jews, the Sephardi, lived in Europe for 1,400 years. They didn't plot to overthrow governments. They didn't plot to get rid of people in Palestine. They didn't make any plots. They said... God himself, if God gave them the land of Israel, in creating the diaspora, God himself had taken it back off them. Mm -hmm. You see? So their view was, God has taken it off us, and we have to wait for God himself to return it to us. And he will not return it, he says, in all the scripture, in the Talmud and the Torah, until the Messiah comes. He will not allow them to return there. In, in the sense of a worldly power and worldly government. And this is the Netere Carta. They say all the time, please, to, to the, uh, the other groups of Jews, you are stopping the Messiah himself from coming. All of the, the works of Israel delay, the, 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 the nation Israel, the state of Israel rather, um, delay the coming of Messiah. That's what they believe. Well, what I believe, and what I believe is that they, they, um, they believe their own camp's rhetoric and dogma. Now, here's what the Christians say, and I think this is, this is even uh, something that I've discussed with uh, Reverend Pike, that the covenant right now has switched over to the Christians over the last 2,000 years, and that these people believe the covenant now is switching back to the direction of the Jews uh, that are coming from this particular group, this... this um, this Khazarian group, but they don't discuss it in those terms. What they say is that Esau is being defeated and that the Messiah, uh, Messiah's arrival is proof that the covenant that God, that God made with the Christians is voided. Mm. And this is, what, this is what Ted has tried to explain to me, and I, I, I'm just repeating what Ted had to say on that uh, subject. Yes, I think, I think uh, what, what Ted is, is, is saying in, in, in a polite way of saying that the Jews are waiting for a Messiah and the Christians are waiting for a Messiah, and the Muslims are to that degree as well, um, and that the Christians and the Muslims are basically waiting for Jesus, peace be upon him and his mother, to return, and the, um, the Jews are waiting for somebody else. And ultimately, you know, that, that will always lead to um, a clash when there are people are waiting for a different Messiah, which doesn't help. Well, let's and move into yesterday's uh, ending thing. We started talking about Sabbatai Zebi and his, his messianic 
uh, musings during a, a period, uh, I think it was the 11th century you, you mentioned? Well, no, no, well, uh, he turns up in, in the, the middle of the, um, the 17th century. 17th. Yeah. But, okay. Uh, but what I want to do is actually give the background to what happened. You know we said that these people focused very much on the Talmud, and a part of the Talmud specifically, um, the Ashkenazim focused on the Kabbalah. And the Kabbalah was a general set of rules that used to be there, and different rabbis and great scholars, sages among the, the Jewish population would come out with their own versions of it. And one man um, in the middle of the 16th century produced a version of Kabbalah which has spawned the entire Jewish messianic movement for the last 400 years. And you said 1666 was the Christian year that they all thought they were going to see a return and the Jews had a similar uh, that the Hasidim and, and, and in the northern parts of Europe that came from this Khazarian group had their own specific Jewish date that kind of coincided with a some messianic prophecy Indeed. that they would bring forward a, a messiah. And uh, didn't Indeed. they say that Sabbatai Zebi was the messiah for a while? Well, well, Sabbatai Zebi was a follower of the Kabbalah of this particular this particular type of Kabbalah, <laughs> which start which started to be spread. And this is what and you will have heard many people talk about Kabbalah and. They make it all, um, I think you use the phrase booga booga and all of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. but, but this man's Kabbalah, this one you won't have heard of before. I'm going to tell you specifically what the name of it is. This is the one which has brought all messianic movements through Judaism. I mean, it's known as the Lurian Kabbalah. Lurian. How do you spell Lurian? It's uh, L-U-R-I-A-N. After Isaac ben Solomon Luria. And this man invented a, a, a twist, a spin on the Kabbalah, a new interpretation and a new way of um, putting it together um, and um, some new practices, spiritual practices, which he, and, uh, um, he himself was related to the Ashkenazi family um, of Leoria in Poland as well. Uh, and he was known among the community, by the way, as the Sacred Lion and some of the people in his day believed that he was possessed of the Holy Spirit and that he was receive, receiving revelations from Elijah and that, he, that his disciples, he allowed even his own disciples and students to believe that he might be the Messiah because he was uh, apparently able to do conjuring tricks, magic tricks with whatever he'd learned or he appeared to the people to have special powers and it influenced them. And I'll give you a quote about this man now from the Encyclopedia Judaica. It says of the Lurian Kabbalah, in no small measure it prepared the ground for the messianic ferment of the Shabbatian movement. So you can't get a better authority than that. And it's saying this Kabbalah, not the Kabbalah that you go and buy down at the bookstore, but this particular one is the one where all the magic tricks, all the conjuring appears from, mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. version of the Kabbalah. And what happened was that um, Sabbatai Zevi was just a, like any other rabbi in that area of the world about a 50 to 70 years now after um, the time of Isaac ben Solomon. Isaac ben Solomon wouldn't allow anybody to teach his version of the Kabbalah while he was alive. After he died, he gave permission to his disciples and students um, who got to a certain stage to teach other people. So it was in limited form. What happened with the Sabbatian movement, Sabbatai Zevi, he um, started having visions. He was practicing this system and he started having visions. He started being able to do conjuring tricks himself. Um, other people who were practicing the same thing as him started to have visions about Sabbatai Zevi being the Messiah. And these guys were great rabbis and spiritual leaders in the community, and they were all having these dreams and visions about him. So it was very much adding to the fervor of the time. Um, and he himself, they say that he didn't believe it to start with and came to believe. I mean, the man is, um, again, one of these things that um, is, is 
whitewashed. You know, they they tried to say well, it wasn't really that important, and he was just an embarrassment in the history of Judaism. Let me tell you this now: at the height of his movement, he had one million Jews following him. That's a big following. In those days, one million Jews, mainly Ashkenazim, but even Sephardim, and because they thought he was going to be the Messiah and they'd been following him for almost 20 years, he got them all practicing this new Kabbalistic system. This is what he got all of his um, uh, disciples, the ones who followed him and believed he was the Messiah, he got them all practicing this en masse. So we've got this enormous change from, you know, the, the Judaism that everybody knew into, hey, this guy is, you know, probably the next Messiah and we're just waiting for it all to happen and for, you know, light to, to break out of the sky. And what happens? Um, he goes to Jerusalem at the height of his popularity mm -hmm. to try and gain um, official blessing from the chief Sephardic uh, rabbis who were still in Jerusalem. They were so frightened by him, the, his presence and the size of his movement and everything like that, um, and they said, we will not recognize you. We refuse to recognize you as the Messiah. And in fact, if you stay in Jerusalem, we will excommunicate you from the community. Mm -hmm. So he knew basically, he was being told by the Sephardi at this stage, we're not accepting you, go home. We, we, if you want to, 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 to have a showdown on this one, we'll, we'll give you a showdown. And they were not convinced about him. And he was very disappointed. He left. He was only in Jerusalem for like a week, and he left very bitter, very angry at the way he'd been treated by them. But he still had his movement following him, and he was returning actually to uh, Turkey um, to to meet with various of his followers. And the the caliph of the day was very worried. The Turkish caliph was not happy about the size of the movement and the way that people were thinking this man was the Messiah and the influence that he had as a result. So the Caliph actually had him arrested. This is a very uh, important part of his history. Right. And, and he was given at sword point an ultimatum, which is you can become a Muslim or die. Um, and he chose to become Muslim. And, the, and so, so that proved to his followers that he didn't have the juice that he said he'd had. This is the, 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 the political ploy of the caliph was, you know, that if I can spread it round like wildfire, send the messengers out that this man's become Muslim, um, they, they, then he'll lose all his following. And uh, that was the, the hope of the caliph. But, uh, and this is what a lot of Orthodox Jews or members of the Jewish community might even try to tell you that the story ends there. Uh, but that's far, far from the truth. The story nowhere near ends there. Uh, what happened was that um, he left, he told his followers, don't worry, this isn't a genuine conversion, I was given no choice. He finished before, he actually disappeared. Nobody truly knows his place of death, it, it's speculated. But he was put in exile to Albania with a hundred followers, mm -hmm. and they all went back to their um, Talmudic and Kabbalistic Judaism. Right. So his followers took hope in the fact that he himself had embraced Judaism, uh, sorry, had embraced Islam, but had left it behind, and it had never been a sincere conversion. It was done under compulsion, and uh, um, this basically gave. Um, permission he said to all of his followers listen you can embrace whatever faith you want so long as you practice this in secret and the whole Sabbatian movement these million people yes he did lose some some followers but it went underground Darrell and this is what's critical for people to understand this movement became a secret movement it was not allowed to practice in front of the caliphate it was not allowed to practice in front of all the other Jews. It reached a stage among Sabbatians that 
even their children, were not told the religion of their household until they had come of age. They would reach 11, 12, 13 years of age, and then they would teach the children the faith. That way their children could play with other children, and they had no fear that their children might tell somebody at school or their friends they were playing with, oh, my dad believes this or my mum does that, you see. They hid it even from their own children. Now, the Sabatian movement, a large number of people in Turkey actually, like him, followed his example and embraced Islam. And they've been known today as the Donme, the Donme Jews of Turkey. Uh, anybody who goes and looks at these people would think that they were just normal Turkish Muslims. And this again is proof of Ashkenazi and ethnicity. The Donme uh, uh, Jews do not look different to anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, the Donme started in the 17th century. The Donme are still there to this day in Turkey. They have survived 250 years. Uh, they are known as the, the wife-swapping Jews of Turkey. Uh, and they also were where the the Young Turks uh, movement was born, where many Armenians still believe the Turks in general uh, were a part of were the reason why those they they were they were slaughtered wholesale. But the fact that it is today we understand they were what we call today crypto Jews, which are these uh, this group you're discussing now uh, got, got themselves ensconced into the highest levels and actually helped. Uh, pers uh, perpetrate that that genocide. In, indeed, Dal, this is this is a, the, the crux of the matter. The beliefs of the Lurian Kabbalah and the practice of the Sabbatian movement is the start of crypto Judaism. The crypto Jew and crypto Judaism. Crypto Judaism tell everybody you believe one thing, really you practice another and believe another. Crypto Jew tell everybody you're a Muslim, really you're a Jew. Tell everybody you're a Christian, really you're a Jew. And, 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 and you can um, do this as far as they were concerned. It was part of the teachings of the Messiah, Zabatai Zevi. So as far as they're concerned, the Messiah himself has given them uh, not only permission, but instruction to start behaving like this. The Donme were used at the time when they needed to overthrow the Caliph to prepare the way for the First World War and... Uh, the establishment of the Jewish national homeland in Palestine, Zionism, um, that's when the Jews actually went back and did a deal with the Don May and said, and, uh, by this, and I'm using the term Jews loosely here because as you'll see, they're, 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 if you study the history, you'll see they were Sabbatians. Another group of Sabbatians went to them and said, we need you to organize a movement. They were living in Salonika at that time. They said, go into Turkey and overthrow the Caliph. And they, they went in there and they established Freemasonic lodges, um, the first Freemasonic lodges in Turkey. And uh, through operating through those lodges over a period of time, they were able to overthrow the, the Turkish Caliphate. Now, the Masonic lodges you're discussing, we're going to go to this now because I want to bring up what, what started now after Sabatai Zevi's um, uh, original, fa <coughs> excuse me, original failure. He... His, his movement actually morphed into several others, and uh, one of them was, and it says so on, 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 a, on a site that I read about it, uh, that he, it ended up morphing into the Frankist movement, didn't it? Well, it, I mean, what happened was that um, after his death disappearance, the leader of um, his movement became, became the leader of the Donme at that time, um, a man who was known as Baruchia Russo, and um, he himself, Baruchia, sent disciples, um, his two most senior disciples, to teach for, uh, Jacob Frank. Frank studied under those, those disciples. And Jacob Frank himself said, Shabbatai Zevi was Messiah, Baruchia was Messiah, and I myself am Messiah, and all three of us are manifestations of God himself. So, to get the timing here, Frank died in 1791, okay? Yeah. That's when he died. And bear in mind that Isaac ben Solomon was pushing his L'Oreal Kabbalah around uh, in around the 1560s. So we can see there that when people try to tell us this movement died with Sabbatai Zevi, it's entirely untrue. More than that, it morphed in Poland into the Hasidim movement. 
So when we see these guys with the Homburg and the curly hair uh, and the thick glasses quite often as well, these were all um, in, in Poland came about through the Sabbatian movement. Um, a lot of them today don't know that's where they originated from, but huge groups of Jews started appearing with different badges, different lapel badges on, you know, different, t -sh different team shirts on, but they were all inspired from the same Kabbalah and the same Sabbatian movement, and they have the same principle. Outside, tell people we practice this. Inside, we practice something else. Now, now this particular group, now the one that has inherited this from in, in, the, in that Russian town of Lubavitch, was a specific sect within that uh, with that Hasidic uh, Zevi uh, Kabbalistic tradition. Well, what we had um, among uh, when people started um, attaching themselves to the Sabbatian manifestation of the Hasidim, two groups of Hasidim, uh, two sects tried to break people away from the Sabbatian movement, one of which um, is the Satmar sect, um, who I, you may have mentioned before, they're, they're aligned with the Netare Carter, they're an anti-Zionist group, who believe in the practice of the Torah and all of the, 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 the dietary rules and complex rules and things like that. And then there was this group in the middle, uh, known as the Habad uh, Hasidim, uh, founded by the Schneerson family. And what they said was, look, there's all these groups of Jews in the middle who they don't want this extreme here and they don't want that extreme there. Let's, let's um, sell them a form of Judaism which they can accept where they're free of all this messianic stuff and, tell them, and agree with them. Yes, the messianic stuff's wrong. And what they did then after they, did, they, they went out to New York, they're the biggest um, Hasidic group out in New York, but as we now see, it was only ever a ploy to extend the Sabbatian movement to more uh, middle-of-the-road Jews who were not involved in these extreme beliefs. Mm -hmm. Because now, today, these people who, who, who built up a following of very wealthy Jews and powerful Jews, uh, bankers and such like, by saying, don't worry, we're not extremist, and you don't have to swap your wife with anybody, and because they're involved in orgiastic wife swapping and all sorts of strange practices, the Sabbateans. They said, look, we, you don't have to worry about that. With us, you can just practice normal um, Judaism, and we'll give you this particular spin. Now, Daryl, today, this very day, out of all the Sabbatean movements, these are the first ones to deny their Sabbatian link, and they're the only ones promoting the Messiah of today. Because they say that they have a Messiah who they are ready to install in Jerusalem. I've, I, I broke that on the show uh, last week, and actually, uh, and actually was kicked off the radio within uh, a day, I think it was. They, 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 <laughs> At their, at their synagogue in Manchester, England, in, uh, which is a long way north of London, a couple of hundred miles north of London for people mm -hmm. out in America, we're, we're another big city here, Manchester, um, at their main synagogue there, they were hanging banners outside saying, uh, Moshiach is coming, Messiah is coming. Now you bear in mind that this group was supposed to be the restoration group of m middle of the road, boring common old garden Judaism but actually it sucked all of these people in and, it, and it's trying to inspire in them a messianic fervor its real purpose was to take Jews of an ordinary background especially in America and get them into messianic fervor but to do it gradually over time so they didn't realize they'd been taken by the hand and led down the garden path and now, I, I have a question I have a question regarding that mm-hmm and here's the thing. We, we know that a, that a large fortune uh, uh, was passed on from, from father to son, and it, it, it actually started back, I think, back in the 14th and 15th centuries. I mean, uh, huge fortunes. And it, it actually was the seed money for fortunes such as Warburg and fortunes such as Rothschild. How does that fit into this story? Well, what we have um, as part of the Sabbatian movement um, we, we, we find that under Frank, um, towards the end of his life, he instructed 
um, his disciples to go to Poland, Warsaw in fact, and to build factories um, and to get established in business and to start making big money. Um, and also, according to Encyclopedia Judaica again, um, his followers became active in the Masonic organizations in Poland too. Okay. Um, you will find that the movement was in Austria with the um, Dobruska family and with the Hernicks. And the, the Hernicks are a huge family in Austria. And they're related to um, um, all, all the big truck manufacturers and, and, and people like that. The, the Hernigs, we've I've heard this name before. How do we spell the Hernigs? H-O-E-N-I-G. And, okay. and you, you'll find that the Hernigs themselves were, 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 were a very powerful family in, in these areas and, and quite open about their Sabbatianism. Um, as was Gottlieb Vela in New York, the, the, the Vela and the, the, uh, the Bondi families. H-O-E-N-I-G, and that's the next one is what? Um, you've got the Bondi, B-O-N-D-I. Uh, this is in Prague now. Uh -huh. uh, the, 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 the Hernigs and the Debruskas uh, um, originated from Austria. Now, did Bondi sp change their name to a B-O-N-D-Y? They, they also spell it that way, that's correct, yeah. Okay, and is there anybody Bundy, B-U-N-D-Y? That could also be another legitimate spelling of it, if you, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, you, you often find there are slight spelling differences in the pronunciation of the East European names when they um, uh, arrived in Germany, uh, in America as immigrants. Now, how about the Reynolds family? Well, you, what happened was also that um, a large number from Bohemia in, in 1848 to 9, a large number of Sabbatians went out to New York and became migrants there. A large number. And that, that is also documented. So that the, the, the Sabbatian movement is very, very deep. And these were openly Frankist, openly Frankist in their beliefs. Again, involved in all the, um, the orgiastic wife swapping and all the other strange practices that they have. Um, which most Jews would, would say, oh, all of this stopped with the Sabbatian movement and the Sabbatai Zevi. But we can actually demonstrate that this was still being practiced in the middle of the 19th century, and even the early 20th century, um, they were still visible. Now, the other thing about Frank, Jacob Frank, is that that is the man who told Adam Weishaupt to found the Illuminati the Bavarian Illuminati. With what intent? The, they try, what, one of the things that the Sabbatian movement is trying to do, if you go back to um, the, 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 the rejection of him, of Zabatai Zevi himself by um, the Sephardim, what they're trying to do is convert, convince all the Jews to follow this Messiah, whoever it is. They're trying to find a, um, a situation where they can get enough influence over the entire Jewish community that they all follow him. Yeah, they can't have this group not agreeing or that group not agreeing. So they keep going back and trying to come up with new groups and new new ways of presenting their Judaism to pull people in, but ultimately to lead them to the same place. Now, and how well, now at this time, 1790. The Rothschilds were already well and established as, as nation crushers, and uh, they had already backed the, the Jacobins in their, in their revolt against the king of, uh, of France. They had already begun uh, with, with dealings with, uh, with Cromwell and, and the rest. I mean, what, how, was, how was their activity monitored by these people, and where did they come in with all this money? Well, uh, okay, well, Adam Weishaupt took his money from Rothschilds in, in, in founding the Illuminati in Bavaria. He was financed by the Rothschild, but the instruction came from, from Jacob Frank himself. So now, the Rothschilds had already been rich for a generation already, and I mean, were, were, they, were they handed their fortune, or did they build it themselves, or was it a mix of both? Or, I mean, who gave them their start over in Frankfurt and Hanover? It, it, their start came through um, um, the, the history of them coming from families which were involved in the financing of trade. They were always involved in trade finance. 
um, which goes back, you know, all, all the way to the very early days of the settlements um, where people were traveling through the middle of the Khazaria, coming in and out. It was the, the, the Jews who were present in Khazaria at that time, before the embracing of the, the, before they embracing Judaism, were the ones who financed the business. They put money up because, of course, the Jews were money lenders of old. They were because they could charge interest on it. The Muslims didn't lend on interest, and the Christians wouldn't lend on interest, but the Jews would, you see. So they were prepared to risk their money on a loan to finance transactions. And so mainly from money lending is how uh, and trade finance is the way that the Rothschilds uh, began to build their fortune. Um, the, of course, they, he made a fortune out of the Battle of Waterloo. I don't know if you know that. Yes, story. I do. I know they, they imploded the, uh, the the stock market and they bought it all back at pennies on the on the pound. Indeed, they they, they sent a false messenger into the London Stock Exchange. They, they, in today's day and age, you would go to jail for doing this, of course. Uh, but they sent a, a messenger in saying that the British had lost the Battle of Waterloo. The stock market plummeted. He bought everything up for pennies. And then the real messengers arrived and said that they'd won, and the stock exchange went up and he sold it all for cash, which he swapped then for gold. Um, that was just, I mean, if you have people who are prepared to cheat, then you, uh, and, and steal from people and defraud people, then you can probably be quite successful in, in this world. And the thing about the Kabbalah is um, that it, it does say that there is no such thing as evil. You know, th these people have a belief that says evil is in the mind of the Gentile. Mm -hmm. And it's only because of their uh, lack of spiritual enlightenment that they believe that, that people are evil or that evil exists. Um, but if they were of a better mind, they would not see these things as evil. It's shamelessness, really. They, they don't see, see, see this just goes beyond anything rational because... The suffering of a human being, or the, the killing of, a, of an innocent, or the, the poisoning of a group, or the slaughtering of, of, a, of a people, or, or the destruction of... A, well, and all of those things have been done by these people, the Armenians, for example, or the destruction of Russia, or the killing of, of the royals and then the nation in France, or the usury they put in to destroy France several times over during the, the 1812 to the 1900s. They just kept plunging France from one crisis into another, culminating in the, in the Dreyfus Affair, which was fabricated uh, from start to finish to cause people to uh, actually, uh, you know, turn against uh, hatred, I mean, turn against the, the, uh, the support for hatred for Jews. In other words, once it came out, the Dreyfus Affair was a, a, um, a fabrication. Everybody said, oh, it wasn't right, it wasn't fair. See what we've done to the Jews, we've been very unfair with them. And as a result of all these different things, I mean, this is my read on it anyway, and it seems to me, it seems to me that, that all of this stuff has been so manipulated. How could they get so good at manipulating our world? Well, it, 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 it comes down to these teachings from Kabbalah, which says that, that you know, in this world there is no, there, there is no evil, or, or it even says in um, another slightly different spin on the same thing, it says the evil in the world is there from the left hand of God. And because God has a left hand where all evil comes from, if we work evil in the world, we are doing God's work in the world. We are working his left hand. These are the, uh, this is absolutely true. You can study, anybody can study the Kabbalah and they will find that these are core teachings. Fundamental, not extreme to one side. These are very, very central to the core. Because they say God is... Uh, uh, infinite, without personality, and therefore evil exists, and they use the Kabbalah as the basis for understanding evil in the world, and they say it exists, but it's not really evil, you see. So it, it, it's just our perception of it. And, and once you get into that mindset, you can do things to other people, uh, you can harm other people, you can demean, you can steal, you can rob, you can cheat, you can lie, because in your own mind and according to your own system of beliefs, it's not evil it's not bad and this is the tragedy of, of the moving away from the Torah because this is any Christian listening to this you know who isn't aware of the fact that these are core teachings are so far from the teachings of the Old Testament and so far from the teachings of the New Testament that the only way they've arrived at them is by adhering to Kabbalah and specifically the Lurian Kabbalah 
and you will find that these people believe the same thing throughout time and, and, and we now have the whole, whole idea of a crypto Jew a Jew who goes undercover and hides L let's just compare mottos for a moment in the world we have here the, the SAS in the, the British military and their motto is who dares wins a kind of like a bravado mm -hmm. my, my school motto was omne bonum ab alto all good comes from above and we look at the, uh, throughout the world, and we have all, all these um, inspiring uh, mottos of people and, and groups. We look at Mossad, what does it say? By way of deception. That's their motto. That's their starting point. Mm -hmm. That's their starting point. Nothing to do with bravery, nothing to do with honor, nothing to do with decency, chivalry, none of the, the positive things. They're straight in there with the dirty. And, 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 and this is uh, uh, because they've been so steeped in this stuff for so long, they can't elevate themselves above it. And we, the rest of us, we live in misery. The Palestinians live in misery. The world lives in misery because these people think that what they're doing isn't evil. Well, I mean, when you look at the plight of the Palestinians, it, it, it's horrendous to have watched it throughout my lifetime. And, of course, uh, they've called that population repeatedly through horrendous acts. But, in fact, the last century, the same group is responsible for the wholesale slaughter uh, on the steps of Russia through Stalin, uh, and through the, their, their, their fabrication of the Nazi movement. If you listen to Untermeyer's speech and listen to uh, what, the, 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 what the evidence brings us, and so when you tally up their murder spree for last century, it's, it's topping off at about 100 million. And, I mean, 100 million human beings, all of them with hopes and dreams. This is evil beyond anything that most people can even fathom. And that is why it is so hard for anybody to, uh, to acquiesce to these truths, because... It is, it is evil that most people are not capable of possessing in their hearts. And this is why most of us say it cannot be. Because they wouldn't be human if this were their, their doctrine. And yet, as I'm beginning to understand clearly, it is not only their doctrine, it is the way they see all things and everything, and it's the, it is the lens by which they focus in on all issues. Salatai Sevi, when he encouraged people into doing the wife swapping and the orgies, completely contrary to, and bear in mind, these people up to this point had been orthodox Jews, you know, who were very, very strict on this kind of stuff. And he managed to convince them, to, to charm them into doing this, um, on the basis of the arguments of Kabbalah, which say, you know, in the highest understanding of God, in the highest manifestation of God, there is no good and bad, there is no right and wrong, there is no evil, there is no left and right, yeah? And, uh, and therefore, if you move into this higher level of morality, you uh, are getting closer to God. And he sold it to them on this, contrary to the teachings of all of the prophets. But is that because, uh, by their, their very core belief, is that the suffering of Esau and the suffering of Amalek is part of what they want to happen? So any create, anything that creates suffering within the community of Esau is going to be you know viewed in their in their minds as something positive it, it's a righteous act because it, as a as a, a, a lurian kabbalist you are implementing the left hand of god yeah his right hand is the justice in the world and they say the left hand of god is the evil in the world but it is permissible for them to work either hand and they and in both cases they are being righteous now uh, who is the who are the practitioners today of this uh, particular sect, and uh, you gave me some names. Let's let's get into the meat now. Mm. Or you, well, I'll tell you something. Well, let's... officially, officially, Darrell, of course, nobody, <laughs> because it all stopped 300 years ago. <laughs> but unofficially, um, the sects you will find are still practicing very strongly. Mm. All of them, and at the moment, the, the um, each one of the Hasidic sects, for instance, that comes out of Poland, has its own tzaddik. And it, the tzaddik is the, um, the man who is able to perform um, um, special powers in front of other people. Is this like a Sham? This is Baal Shem is the term. Um, the, the, it, it, historically, it was a Baal Shem. Now we call him in the Hasidic movement 
uh, among Hasidic Jews is called a tzaddik, tzaddik, and the idea is that the tzaddik can actually um, do conjuring tricks or has special powers, and the people congregate round him, and he and he, somebody from his congregation who can demonstrate the same powers, he becomes the new head. But believe you me, Daryl, even the Lubavitcher was supposed to be the most rational out of all of this before they got messianic further uh, within the last ten years. We, uh, and for the Lubavitch to come out and start preaching uh, messianism is just like shocking in, in the uh, Hasidic world, what's going on. But the, the other thing is that the average Jew in the street looks at these guys and says, oh, they're the ultra-religious community, uh, we just follow them because most Jews can't be bothered to look into the books and they're not bothered about understanding it. It's all too complex for them and I'm not blaming them because they don't know what these guys are, actually believe and what they do and what they practice. All they know is that when they're told this guy is the chief tzaddik and he's got all these paranormal powers or, you know, whatever they, they, they happen to be, that they believe that he has paranormal powers, that when they believe that, then if this man says we need money for this and we need money for that, they give it to him. But don't, don't they still have the support of the financial um, elites that are in the Jewish community? I mean, we're talking, these people have trillions. Uh, uh, we, the the, the Warburg have... fortune alone, the Sheaf fortune, the Goldman fortune, the, the, the Kahn fortune, the Loeb fortune, we're talking money here. Mm. But all of these people follow rabbis. Remember, they have a spiritual leader. Just like in, it's the same structure as we, we see in Iran. We have billionaires in Iran, but if the Ayatollahs say we want money for this and we want money for that, they put the money in, they write the checks. It's exactly the same thing. The people who have the, the power in the community are the spiritual leaders. And if the spiritual leaders, they're not asking for money personally, they're saying we want you to build this in Palestine or we want you to arrange such and such a thing to happen, then these guys go out and do it for them because it's an order from the rabbi. It's a, a bit like we're receiving an order from the bishop or an order from the pope. Well, they, they have this clout, they have this power in the community. Well, I want to, I want to say this, Mohammed. Um, uh, we're going to stop right now, and I'll tell you why. We've just done a lot of stuff.